Thank you very much, John, and good evening and welcome to everyone for this uh, dinner tonight for our Landmark Alliance 21 conference, uh, looking at the issue of Australia and the United States, uh, our alliance in an emerging Asia. It is my great honor, ladies and gentlemen, and pleasure to be able to present to you uh, the Australian Governor General, His Excellency, the Honorable Sir Peter Cosgrove. Sir Peter was sworn in as Australia's 26th Governor General on the 28th of February this year. He came to this position after a long and distinguished career uh, in the Australian Armed Forces and, of course, in the wider public service. Sir Peter, prior to being appointed Chief of the Defence Force uh, in 2002, had held multiple leadership roles, including Chief of the Army, and best known, perhaps, to many of us as Commander of Interfet, the International Task Force uh, of, for East Timor. In this role, he played a pivotal and historical uh, role in overseeing the transition of East Timor uh, towards its independence. After leaving the Defense Force in 2005, Sir Peter once again drew attention for his leadership skills when he was placed in charge of the reconstruction after the, after the devastation wrought by Cyclone Larry in North Queensland in 2006. Under less traumatic circumstance, he also proved his leadership, serving on the boards of Qantas, the Australian Rugby Union, among others, and of course he was the Chancellor of the Australian Catholic University. Throughout the Governor General's career in the Defense Force, in public and private life, uh, he's been witness, I think, to both the strengths uh, and the challenges that often face the US-Australia relationship. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are deeply honored that he's able to spend time with us tonight and speak to these issues. May I present, ladies and gentlemen, the Governor General, His Excellency, General the Honorable Sir Peter Costa. Uh, let me align myself with the uh, respects paid to the traditional owners of the land and their elders past and present. Uh, may I say with such a glittering array of uh, very, very well known Australians and Americans uh, in this room, uh, I simply grab you all and call you distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight to support the Alliance 21 uh, and the United States Study, Study Centre of the University of Sydney in this significant place. And, my compliments to the War Memorial for once again finding just such an apposite uh, uh, setting for this celebration of your gathering uh, under the banner of Alliance 21. A, a study centre is an important concept reflecting on the past through study to educate ourselves for the future. The attendance of so many distinguished statesmen and stateswomen, scholars, and political, business and military leaders adds further credence to the reputation of the United States Study, Study Centre in attracting the, the best minds and driving innovative dialogue. Bates, I congratulate you, the Board of Directors and the Council of Advisors for the first rate analysis, research and teaching undertaken by the centre, its staff and students. And I commend all involved in the productive dialogue today. Leading experts from both sides of the Pacific gathered for a contemporary appraisal of the US-Australia relationship, seeking to identify challenges and opportunities, debating, collaborating, exchanging ideas, learning, studying in order to educate for the future. I look forward to hearing more about your rigorous discussions during the course of this evening and hoping to see the final report once it's been presented to the government. Tonight, above all, we celebrate the alliance between Australia and the United States, our bonds of friendship, our respect, trust and common interests. We signal our commitment to deepening our already diverse and mature relationship and we acknowledge the concentrated effort and strategic direction that must be applied to properly foster our future relationship. And the pragmatists, realists, the 
political amongst us will always lean on the real politic of permanent interests rather than permanent alliances and all those sorts of things which are cautionary uh, in the approach to any relationship. But it has so deeply an emotional uh, quotient as well. Like many here, I was in the Great Hall of our own Parliament here in late 2001 after the horrors of 9-11 when a magnificent legate to Australia, Tom Schieffer, led from the US side uh, a mourning for all those who'd been killed and bereaved uh, in the atrocious attacks. Uh, the Great Hall was full. I was on one wing of uh, a full, uh, I don't know how many, hundreds of people, but it was full to capacity. And the centre block were citizens of the United States, embassy staff in the main. And at the end of that service, which was solemn, and I think very much uh, out of respect to what had happened in New York and Washington, there was that sombre note, both national anthems were sung. And of course, mostly Australians, so we sang our own quite loud. But in the first time I've ever experienced it in that friendship, which is undoubted between the United States and Australia, every man and woman in that great gathering sang the US national anthem, Australian or United States citizen, as if it was their own on that occasion. I think we must always factor in that very strong emotional bond between our two countries. As we approach the 150th anniversary of the death of one of the most inspiring figures of democracy anywhere, Abraham Lincoln, we can pause to acknowledge his mastery of the spoken word. Uh, he understood that words in democratic pra practice inspired deeds and those deeds serve the democratic ideal. And I just recall some famous words, that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. A clarion call to democratic governments all around the globe. Sentiments picked up by another inspiring wartime leader, Winston Churchill, 76 years later, when addressing the United States Congress during World War II. He said, I have steered confidently towards the Gettysburg ideal of government. Sure I am, this day, we are masters of our fate, that the task which has been set before us is not above our strength, that its pangs and toils are not beyond our endurance, as long as we have faith in our own cause. Just last week, Prime Minister Abbott and President Obama, on behalf of our two nations, reiterated our steadfast commitment to our ideals and union. They said, when our countries stand together, our nations and the world are more secure, more prosperous and more just. Bound by our shared history and values, that is the cause to which we rededicate ourselves today. I think if we together can keep that as our text, our guiding text, uh, then we're in good shape for studying the past and the present in order to educate and prepare ourselves for the future. I thank you all for your allegiance to the cause enunciated by our two leaders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Peter. We, we very much appreciate uh, those remarks and for uh, launching our dinner uh, for this evening. Um, I'm just going to say a few words uh, uh, for Sir Peter's benefit, I hope, and for others who uh, may not be as familiar with the work of Alliance 21 and uh, uh, the work of the U.S. Studies Center, but I'll be very brief and we'll have a short uh, video to show as well before we get to, get to, uh, get to our dinner and conversations amongst ourselves. Um, the U.S. Studies Center was founded uh, f uh, about six years ago, and it was uh, formed um, by a vision by several people who felt that um, given the importance of the relationship between our two countries, it was important that there be a center that could help uh, not only study and understand from an academic perspective, but also serve as a platform from which uh, events like this could, could form. In order to help assure that not only in Australia, uh, but around the world, 
uh, that is our ambition at least, to assure that there is a balanced and helpful understanding about the United States and its role in the world. Um, it's been my uh, great honor and privilege to be able to uh, be the CEO of this organization, which is multifaceted in so many ways, providing education to over 1,300 uh, students per year, sending nearly 200 students from Australia a year to the United States, offering coursework across a range of issues, not just foreign policy and politics, but covering American art, American literature, American music, American culture, and beyond. We've been very happy to have an active media presence here in Australia and increasingly in the region and even in the United States, where we're able to comment and try to offer some insight to the broader public about, uh, about the United States and about important issues uh, that are occurring in the U.S. and which have an impact not only in Australia, but of course around the world. And we've been very, very fortunate, I think, to be able to generate support from governments uh, here in Australia, uh, but also corporate uh, sponsors, as well as other private philanthropic sponsors, who see us as a partner to help them bring a profile and understanding and insight to key issues that affect not only the United States, but affect Australia and the world. It's a remarkable organization, and I must say that we're very, very fortunate to have achieved a partnership with the University of Sydney in order to carry out this partnership such that we can draw from the rich resources available there at the university and yet also serve as a kind of public policy platform. It's a remarkable organization and I'm very, very proud to be the head of it and um, I just encourage all of you as you can to uh, join even further with us deep in our relationship. Let's go forward and grow this remarkable organization uh, so that we can um, continue the kind of work that we're doing for young people, uh, for persons across Australia and into the region and even back into the United States. Alliance 21, likewise, remarkable institution, uh, an organization that's been going on now for almost three years under the able leadership of, of Robert Hill and Professor Jeffrey Garrett um, that's trying to look at the breadth and depth of this relationship between the United States and Australia in all of its facets uh, so that we understand that underneath it all are deeply held common interests, serious interests that our two nations share and that is going to be the foundation upon which we can go forward uh, into a very interesting, dynamic, challenging period for both of our nations, not least here in the Asia-Pacific region. And today's discussions, I think, were remarkable in, in their breadth and in their depth, and in their ability to try and help inform us and remind us of just how much we have at stake, our two nations, in allowing and in assuring that we continue to have this positive, and as you said, Sir Peter, uh, almost emotive understanding of one another uh, so that we can assure ourselves that 10, 20, 70, 100 years from now, uh, we continue to be the best of friends and moving forward and progressing the values and the interests that we share. So let me thank you all once again for this opportunity uh, to, to bring us all together, remind ourselves, and to look to the future. We will draw from today's discussions and the discussions of the past two or three years uh, of Alliance 21 to come forward in the uh, months ahead uh, with a set of findings and recommendations uh, for both of our governments, which we hope will make an enduring contribution uh, to, uh, to, to this very, very special and remarkable relationship. If I may, uh, may I call upon uh, our technical geniuses uh, to please uh, uh, roll a videotape that tells a little bit more about the work of Alliance 21. Thank you once again. Launched in 2011, the Alliance 21 program is led by the United States Study Centre at the University of Sydney. With support from the Australian Government and corporate partners, 
The project provides a contemporary perspective on one of the Asia-Pacific's strongest partnerships. It is a partnership of importance to each of us, but it's also a partnership that must remain at the core of the kind of engagement we have in the Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific regions for now and for the future. The Alliance 21 project is conceiving of new ways that our Alliance can build on our shared history to identify the challenges and opportunities to devise joint strategies to create our shared future. More than 100 experts have taken part in Alliance 21 forums Australia-wide and across America, bringing together leaders from business, government and academia. The strengths and challenges of the relationship have been analysed across six themes of US-Australian engagement. Defence and security, energy security, natural resources and the environment, education and innovation, trade and investment, and emerging Asia. The project is informing public and policy debate, and we will soon present our recommendations to both Washington DC and Canberra in order to further strengthen Australia-US collaboration. This alliance is more than a security pact. It's a commitment by two like-minded liberal democracies to support the values that underpin our way of life. Free enterprise, free trade, free speech, and a belief in citizens ahead of government. So I commend the US Studies Centre for its work driving the Alliance 21 program. It uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce our host here for this evening, uh, a man whose uh, CV is as long and varied as anyone in attendance today, uh, former senior medico, uh, Australian politician, diplomat, now director of the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. Please welcome Dr. Brendan Nelson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, General Sir Peter Cosgrove, Governor-General, uh, Ministers, uh, Jeff Garrett and uh, Robert Hill, uh, Shadow Ministers, Senators and Members, Members of the Diplomatic Corps, of the intellectual and military communities from Australia and of the United States, welcome to the Australian War Memorial. And my wife would say to you at this point, please continue to eat because you must enjoy something for the next 10 minutes. So please do so. When I uh, had briefly spoke to the Alliance 21 conference in Washington in January, I related an anecdote that happened to me when I got off the plane at Fort Worth. And I approached the customs officer, a very friendly man, and uh, gave him my passport. And he looked at my passport, he looked at me, he looked at the passport again, and he said, Australian War Memorial. He said, we should have one of those here in the United States. And he said, my son came back from Afghanistan late last year, and he was raving about the Aussies. And I said to him, every time the United States picks a fight, the Americans are the first, the Australians are the first in with us, and they are the last out. Now that might be a simple way of seeing it, but in many ways there is truth in it. Every nation has its own story. Australia's story is here, the Australian war, represented not so much by the objects and items that are presented within it, but by the services and sacrifices of two million men and women who wear and who have worn the uniform of the Royal Australian Navy, Army and Royal Australian Air Force over more than 100 years. The origins of the Australian War Memorial are in the First World War, as is the alliance that we have with the United States. Australia was a population of just over four and a half million people in 1914. We had a million men who were of an age that could volunteer from a nation that twice rejected conscription, of which my generation should be immensely proud. 
413,000 of them volunteered. 330,000 were sent overseas. Four years later, 62,000 would be dead. Another 60,000 would be dead within 10 years of returning from 155,000 that were wounded. This magnificent institution was the vision of Australia's first World War official historian, Charles Bean. Bean landed with the Australian troops at Gallipoli on the 25th of April 1915. He stayed with them at the front through the entire war and carried a Turkish bullet in his thigh from the August offensive in 1915 for the rest of his life. At Posy Air France in 1916, where Australia had 23,000 casualties in six weeks, Bean wrote in his diary in late July, many a man lying out there at Posy Air and in the low scrub of Gallipoli, with his poor, tired senses barely working through the fever of his brain, has thought in his last moments, well, it's over. But in Australia, they will be proud of this. A short time later, a mortally wounded Australian asked Bean, will they remember me in Australia? And from that he conceived and was determined to build a museum and a memorial to the finest army that he had experienced, the men of the Australian Imperial Forces and the nurses. But as I said earlier, it was at the Battle of Hamel on the 4th of July, 1918, under the stunning leadership of the Australian General Sir John Monash, that Australians, two divisions, and four companies of Americans fought together. A brilliantly executed battle, but nonetheless one in which 200 Americans were casualties and 39 were killed. And we have on my immediate left, to your right, two relics from that battle. A signal flag from the 132nd uh, Company that was given to the 13th Battalion of the Australians to thank the Australians for what they had done and webbing and a water bottle from an American seriously wounded from the 131st Company. For us as Australians, the two most important years in our history was 1788 the arrival of the First Fleet and everything that would mean for Indigenous Australians and the pioneering efforts of those first British settlers and those who'd come in the 19th century. But the other most important year was 1942. And you are here in Anzac Hall. We're under a Lancaster bomber, 89 missions, crewed mainly by Australians. And to correct you, John, just up behind me is a Messerschmitt ME109, the only one in the world in original livery. On the other side of it, behind me, is a Japanese midget submarine, one of three that got into Sydney Harbour looking for USS Chicago in 1942. In 1942, after the fall of Singapore, we knew that we would have to look across the Pacific to the United States. Five days later, Darwin was bombed, Townsville and Broome, Ishuava, Milne Bay, Guadalcanal, the Coral Sea, Midway, and many other, other theatres in the Pacific. There's not a day in this country that goes by where privately or pu publicly, we do not give thanks for American sacrifice in the Pacific from 1942 to the end of the war. The alliance finalised and formalised, of course, in 1951. The chief, chief of the Turkish Air Force was here with the Air Marshal Jeff Brown about a year ago and we were standing in the commemorative area through which you came to come in, back here into Anzac Hall. And he pointed to the name in bronze of one of the theatres where Australians had fought over the last hundred years and he asked me why were Australians there? And I said, General, that is a very important question because in answering it in your journey of discovery, you will learn who we are and what makes us tick. The political capital of the nation is represented in our parliament on the other end of the lake, down Anzac Parade. But the soul of the nation is here. Our values, our beliefs, 
the way we relate to one another and see our place in the world. And it has been shaped largely by American sacrifice and what we have done with the United States from the First World War, certainly through the Second World War, and as you know, every major conflict of the 20th century. As John mentioned in his introduction, I spent uh, three years in Europe representing Australia's interest in NATO, the European Union and a few other things. I said to the Europeans on more than a few occasions, I said, don't export your foreign policy into Asia, predicated primarily on a preoccupation with human rights and rule of law and all of those ideals which we share. But the thing that is most important is to be clear about your own values and not lecture others about them. In a world and in a region of very deep geostrategic uncertainty and unresolved historical enmities, as the most important relationship in the world is being forged between China and the United States and being forged in our region, the thing that we have to be clearest about is who we are and our values, if we are to be respected and continue to grow our influence as Australians and indeed as an alliance in the region. And that is why this institution is so important. It isn't just about our history, it is actually much more to do with our future. To remind ourselves of who we are, in what we believe, and the truths by which we live that are worth fighting to defend. Not all of you will have been into it, but in the Hall of Memory, where the unknown Australian soldier is interred, are 15 stained glass windows. Enshrined into the basis of them are 15 values, which Charles Bean, the founder, and the first director, John Trelaw, who'd been at the Gallipoli Landing as a then junior army officer, saw in the men and women as nurses that they regarded as being essential for victory in battle, but also depth and breadth of character. Resource, candor, devotion, curiosity, independence, comradeship, ancestry, patriotism, chivalry, loyalty, coolness, control, audacity, endurance, and decision. And finally, when Bean articulated the vision for this institution in 1948, he said, here is their spirit in the heart of the land they loved, and here we guard the record which they themselves made. It is our privilege, those who lead and manage this magnificent institution, to not only see that we guard that record, but that in doing so, we know that Australians are proud of it and are constantly reminded of who we are. And I say to our American friends that are here, it is when I bring our VIP visitors to the end of the aviation hall and the war in the Pacific and that part of the Second World War galleries that without me actually having to say it, they understand why there is an alliance built on capability, intelligence, interoperability, security cooperation, but through Alliance 21, as you know, with a vision which expands much more beyond that into economic, trade, G20, environment, education, and many other fields. You are welcome here. You always will be. And we will guard the record of the Alliance as it was forged in bloody sacrifice. Thank you. Now, I want to... Uh welcome everyone once again and, and, and extend our, our great gratitude, of course, to Brendan Nelson uh, and for that just remarkable and moving speech that you just gave, uh, Brendan, and thanks so much. And most of all, most of all, uh, a thanks to the Australian people for this remarkable testament uh, to, as uh, Brendan said, to who they are. Quite remarkable. Um, I'm going to have the great pleasure just now to uh, introduce our next speaker. It is the Honorable Senator David Johnston, Minister of Defense here in Australia. Uh, Senator Johnston uh, has had a long involvement with us uh, on the Alliance uh, 21 project. 
He first joined our discussions uh, about the U.S.-Australia relationship more than a year ago when we convened a, uh, a relatively small but I think quite interesting defense roundtable in Washington, D.C. At that point, Minister Johnston was the shadow minister for defense. Uh, and the perspective that he was able to bring, I would say even the enthusiasm he was able to bring uh, to the issues we discussed there around military and defense issues, I think, impressed us all in Washington. It was also very clear that uh, if and as he was to reach the office to which uh, he was aspiring, then uh, we would all be very fortunate indeed. And of course, he has since gone on uh, with the uh, most recent election back in uh, September to become uh, the Minister of Defense. And you'll agree uh, that the time that he spent in opposition, a son of Western Australia from Perth, uh, and the time he's devoted in that period uh, to getting to know the Alliance, both through our project and many, many other avenues, is quite apparent uh, in his ability uh, and his uh, capacity to understand not just the Alliance, but uh, what is a interesting and changing and dynamic period for uh, the Australian Defense Forces writ large. Uh, today, David, um, we've, we've been privileged to hear from a number of leaders, really the topmost leaders uh, from both Australia and the United States, representing military, diplomatic, economic, and business perspectives from both sides of the Pacific. And of course, what's uh, uh, been important in all of that is underscoring just how important our relationship is has been and certainly will be uh, going to the future. Uh, so uh, this will be our last and uh, final distinguished guest for today. Um, we're very, very pleased that you're able to join us today, uh, David, uh, Minister Johnston, and we look forward very much to your remarks and thank you once again for your uh, continuing support for the work of the Study Center uh, and of course for Alliance 21. Let me uh, again have the great pleasure and honor of welcoming once again Minister David Johnston to the podium. Well, thank you, Bates, and let me thank you for the work that you do as CEO of the U.S. Study Centre. And uh, the very large crowd we have here tonight is a great credit to you particularly. Um, Governor-General, His Excellency General the Honourable Sir Peter Cosgrove, um, my Cabinet colleague Andrew Robb, United States Ambassador John Berry, Daniel Russell, the United States Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, uh, Ambassador Carl Eikenbury, sitting next to me at the table. Delighted to see you here, Carl. Major General Richard Simcock, Deputy Commander, US Marine Corps Forces Pacific. Um, my former parliamentary leader, my good friend uh, Robert Hill, former Minister for Defence. Um, my also good friend and former party leader, Brendan Nelson. Well done with the Australian Mor Memorial, Brendan. You're doing a fabulous job. And I, and I love coming over here. Um, defence leaders, political colleagues, business leaders, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Can I start by saying that in 1908, the then Prime Minister, Alfred Deakin, in inviting the United States Great White Fleet to Australia, stated, and I quote, no other federation in the world possesses so many features of likeness to that of the United States as does the Commonwealth of Australia. And I doubt whether any two peoples can be found who are in nearer touch with each other and are likely to benefit more by anything that tends to knit their relations more closely. Now, earlier this month, in speaking to the United States Chamber of Commerce in Washington, our current Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, noted, Australia has been America's partner in every conflict from World War I to Afghanistan. Undoubtedly, America will have more important friends. Occasionally, America will have more useful friends but America will never have a more dependable friend than Australia. For more than a century now, the relationship between Australia and the United States has been the rock upon which our interoperability, our operational trust and our great friendship has been built. At this conference, dealing as it does with our shared interests and the future of the Alliance in an emerging Asia, it is, in, it is useful to contemplate how far the Alliance has come and the potential that it holds to go even further. The fact that our alliance has, in, has endured and grown um, in importance is testimony to the will of both of the United States 
and of Australia. In 64 years since its signature, the Alliance has evolved to be um, an anchor of peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific region and beyond. As flagged in the Australian-US ministerial meeting joint communique from 2013 meeting that I was proud to attend with my friend and colleague, Julie Bishop, the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Those were the words that um, flowed from that. What has set the Alliance relationship apart has been its ability to dynamically and cohesively meet the varying security situations of the day. Today, the Alliance sees high levels of cooperation high levels of interoperability between Australia and the United States uh, across the full suite of our defence planning, our capability development and operational activities, as well as a desire to build new levels of cooperation to meet emerging security challenges in space, the cyber domain and ballistic missile defence. The force posture initiatives, which Minister Bishop and I signed in 2013, uh, reaffirmed by Prime Minister Abbott and President Obama with the conclusion of the agreement at their meeting on the 12th of June, reflect this evolution. Can I pause to thank Ambassador John Berry um, for his friendship, his understanding, for his engagement, because it was his determination to have a document ready for that meeting that saw us on a daily basis in communication working on how we can make the relationship uh, reduced to writing be a successful document for the signing uh, by the Prime Minister and by the President. At the heart of the Force Posture Initiatives is the US rotational presence in Northern Australia uh, of the US Marine Corps and the US Air Force as well as some opportunities for further uh, naval cooperation. The purpose of the Force Posture Initiatives though is the advancement of peaceful, secure and a prosperous Asia-Pacific Indian Ocean region as a whole. And at present, that goal is as important as any uh, today as at any time since the treaty signature in 1951. Having just come back from Japan, I can say the temperature is very high in that part of the world. Our collective interest in maintaining peace and security in our region is far greater now than ever before. While Australia does not take a position on competing claims in the South China Sea or the East China Sea, we have a legitimate interest in the maintenance of peace and stability, respect for international law, unimpeded trade and, of course, freedom of navigation. We share the serious concerns expressed by ASEAN over recent territorial tensions in the South China Sea and, of course, we urge all parties consistently and repeatedly to exercise restraint refrain from actions that could increase tensions and to clarify and pursue claims in accordance with international law. As I noted at the Shangri-La conference in late May, the cost of a breakdown in security through miscalculation of intentions or actions that run contrary uh, to the general principles of respect for international law and the flee free flow of goods and services through our region would have catastrophic consequences for all of our nations and the economic prosperity um, of the region, a prosperity that I must underline and say has been the envy of the rest of the world in recent times. Australia is a country that has had many and great strengths. An economy in the top 15 in the world is in fact no mean feat for a country now of some 23 million people. That position has been built on our capacity as a trading nation. As a trading nation, we are dependent on the free trade of goods and services to markets across the world. But I should point out that on any given day, about 40% of the total value of our exports is on the South China Sea or just adjacent to it. Australia cannot be secure in an insecure region. Australia cannot be secure in an insecure region. What happens in our region is of vital consequence to Australia and we must be a strong and committed partner to the United States as it continues the rebalance to the Asia Pacific and Indian Ocean regions. And to our regional friends and neighbours, if we are to maintain regional stability and security, a regional stability and security that has to this point in time served us so very well. The free trade of goods and services is built upon a rules-based global order, unconstrained access to the sea lanes and global communications 
and computing networks that connect and bind our region together. Any disruption to these lines of communication, physical or virtual, would have a fundamental adverse impact upon Australia. A stable region must be founded on transparency. And indeed, transparency is at the heart of our white paper process, something I'll talk about in a moment. Um, a stable region must be founded not only on transparency, but also the peaceful resolution of disputes and respect for international law and territorial integrity. These are core Australian strategic interests. They also equate with our values and who we are as a nation. We share these interests, we share these values with the United States. We cannot and we will not be a passenger in the region's economic and security affairs. They are moving quickly and we need to be part of the transformation occurring as of now across our region. We are seeing transformation in our strategic environment of a scale and intensity that we have not witnessed since the Second World War. And the concentration of global economic and military power in our region is unprecedented in Australia's history. The government has recently announced that it has commenced work on a new defence white paper. As I have mentioned, transparency is at the heart and soul of that document, but also is engagement. These are the hallmarks of the way we go forward in doing our defence process. The white paper will set out this government's vision for our future defence strategy and the capabilities we require to be a strong and capable partner of the United States and of our regional friends and neighbours. The White Paper will assess our strategic environment and the changes underway in our region and around the globe. It will set out what we want the Australian Defence Force to be able to do in those circumstances and how it can be achieved with the resources available. Defence policy will be reviewed and refined to ensure that it takes account of contemporary and emergent threats and challenges. This will determine the strategic guidance for the force we need to achieve defence strategy within the resources that we have. It must be affordable and it must be fit for purpose. This means being clear about what the Australian Defence Force must be able to do for those tasks that determine the force structure and how we might achieve them. A force structure review conducted as part of the white paper process will assess these issues in depth. This is the core of the white paper and will be very, very thorough. As I have said previously, it must be dispassionate, analytical and capable of challenging established beliefs. And it must balance cost and capability. This is the essence of why we are going down this path to do this process. We must strike the appropriate balance between credible cost, credible resourcing and the capabilities that is yielded by such a credible financial plan not assessing elements individually, but a whole of at, a, at a whole of capability level. But it's not just about the force structure we will have over the next few decades, but how we use our resources to shape our security environment through firstly, our sovereign defence and national security capabilities. Secondly, of course, our alliance with the United States. And thirdly, our regional defence security partnerships. We need to draw the most we can from each of these levers to shape the peace so that we don't have to use our Australian Defence Force in conflict. Strengthening our cooperation with the United States, including through force posture initiatives in Northern Australia, our capacity and technology uh, partnership, and through strengthening the level of interoperability with US forces at all levels, will remain key drivers and continue to be a key, ob key objectives for us. And alongside this, will be a much deeper focus on building institutional defence partnerships in our region. That will require us to review the way we prioritise and resource regional defence engagement. Military diplomacy is something that is absolutely fundamental to Australia. And so the government, and I particularly, view engagement on a military defence basis across the region through our defence attaches as being one of the most vital hallmarks of the way we conduct our defence business in the region. Australia continues to develop our defence relationship with Japan 
and Julie Bishop and I have just come back, as many of you know, from Japan last week. Um, we, we concluded there the fifth Australian-Japan Foreign and Defence Ministerial Consultation, the fifth two plus two. We agreed to elevate the partnership with Japan to meet our shared goals for regional peace and stability. This will include negotiations on a defence science, technology and material agreement announced during Prime Minister Abbott's visit to Japan earlier in the year. The agreement will allow Australia and Japan to jointly develop defence technologies, establishing a basis to deepen defence cooperation. And naturally we accept, e expect to see stronger trilateral activities between Australia, Japan and the United States as part of this initiative. And as I have said, the transformation in our strategic environment must be matched by a transformation in how we do business in defence. We will undertake a first principles review of defence this year that will identify the value defence creates and propose the most efficient means of delivering this essential public good. It will include a review of capability development, acquisition and sustainment and cost to industry of doing business with defence and seeking to implement simpler, faster and more cost-effective tendering and acquisition. The outcomes of this first principles review will be a key input to the white paper and will be integrated into the decision the government must make about our defence strategy, our defence capability, our organisation and our resourcing. We will make these decisions and choices carefully and methodically to produce a realistic and achievable and credible plan that aligns our strategic ambitions and force structure with a long-term budget plan. Many Australians here will be familiar with the remark by the former Secretary of Defence, Sir Arthur Tang, when he said, a strategy without dollars is not a strategy. We certainly understand that in defence. I think it's important to emphasise this government's strong commitment to increasing defence spending. We are delivering on our election commitment to end Labor's cuts to defence and to growing the defence budget to 2% of GDP within a decade. With our first budget, we have begun the path to 2% with the final profile to be settled following the White Paper and we are determined to pull our weight as an alliance partner. May I note how pleasing it was to hear that President Obama remark uh, on this uh, during the PM's visit last week when he said, and I quote, Australia under the Prime Minister's leadership is increasing its defence budget even under tough times, recognising that we all have to make sure that we're doing our fair share to help maintain global order and security. So ladies and gentlemen, in concluding, let me say that the government has a clear priority for ensuring that Australia has the capability we need for a strong, prosperous and secure Australia today and for our future. We are committed to the further development of the alliance relationship with the United States a relationship that has so successfully endured and our shared vision of peace, security and prosperity across the Asia Pacific and Indian Ocean regions. The White Paper, together with its engagement and its commitments, is a key means by which we will set that vision for Australia, a vision that we want and need for our future and for the Alliance relationship that we can take to even greater levels of interoperability, of trust and of course, and importantly, of great friendship. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much indeed to Senator David Johnston, the Minister for Defence. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce once again a former Minister for Defence, former Senator indeed, and current co-director of the Alliance 21 program, Professor Robert Hill. Well, thank you. Um, my task is, is simple. It's to wind up the formal part of the evening with some um, thanks. Uh, and um, firstly, I'm sorry that you didn't see the video, but it's not true that I sabotaged it. Uh, you would have found that uh, my starring, in my starring role I didn't improve much on what you saw today on the, in the video, but uh, nevertheless. Um, of course, uh, in starting off, I want to thank the Governor-General, Peter Cosgrove, for uh, joining us tonight and particularly in endorsing the work of the Centre and the work of this uh, Alliance 21 uh, project. It's very important to us 
uh, and we're grateful that you were willing to come along tonight and do so. And to do so in this venue, uh, you know, sends a very strong signal, very, very symbolic, and we, and we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, secondly, to thank my old friend Brendan Nelson for uh, his um, welcome, but um, more importantly, his, his, his message. And what I like about Brendan's message is that um, uh, it, does, uh, it does tell us to remember the past and to respect the sacrifices of those who went before. But the way in which he sees the memorial is also uh, an investment in the future, an investment in the attitudes and values that will do well for Australia in the future. Uh, I, is the way in which I would like to see this, uh, this, this, uh, this war memorial seen uh, and the fact that he goes out and sells it that way I think is a strong and very important message to the Australian people, particularly to young Australians. So I thank you, Brennan, for the leadership that you're providing to the memorial and also for the work you've done in support of our project. Thirdly, I need to thank my other old friend and parliamentary colleague, David Johnston, for his, import, his important address tonight, his important defence speech, and uh, uh, I've listened to a few over the years and given a few over the years, as has Brendan. Um, it's interesting, uh, the similarities of our backgrounds, and we're all back here together, together again. Maybe that's, uh, there's a message in that, uh, in that as, as well. Um, Andrew Robb has come along again tonight, and uh, uh, I appreciate that, Andrew. I know that um, being here tonight, you and David, means that you're missing out on kicking up your heels at the mid-winter ball. So what a sacrifice. <laughs> uh, but uh, Andrew, Andrew Robb, David Johnston, and Julie Bishop, the three ministers who spoke to us today, and we only asked three, and all three, without any hesitation, said, we will be with you. And that's on a sitting day in Canberra, which is not easy. So um, I, I thank the three of you for your contribution. I wanted to thank our overseas uh, uh, contingent from the United States, uh, all um, you know, highly respected individuals from their different, different fields, whether it's been trade or military or foreign policy and, and others. You have um, enriched the day and you've, you've helped us in the development of our, of our thoughts. Uh, I thank the Australian speakers also. I thank the staff and I thank for all who've participated in the day. Uh, we, um, we, uh, we actually really do believe this, that, uh, that uh, if we speak of the Alliance in terms of the broader relationship the breadth and depth of the Australian-US relationship, then it will be better understood and appreciated by our communities, both here and across the Pacific, that it is, in a narrow sense, a security pact, but in a broader sense, it reflects this, this myriad of mutual interests that we have that gives it such a strong foundation and a foundation that will be just as relevant, if not more relevant in the future than it's been in the past. And that's why we've developed this program and that we're seeking to sell that. And we're doing it under Bates's leadership now at the US Study Centre, and thank you, Bates. And I've done it in conjunction with Bates's uh, predecessor, Jeff Garrett, who's here with us tonight, but will be about to leave us to take over the role of Dean of the Wharton School which I think is the third rated, third rated business school in the world, so it's quite an achievement for Jeff to move on to that uh, to level. So thank you all, and um, I hope you found it a productive day, as well as finding it an enjoyable day, uh, and uh, I wish you good night.